chapter number 19. Last time we saw Elijah, he had uh, been up on Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal were shown to be exactly what they are, nothing. They found their judgment. They found their eternity that day, and it was an eternity separated from God. Elijah showed great grace and mercy to Ahab. We, we saw the power of prayer. And after three years of desperation, no rain, God brought the rain. And when God brings it, he brings it in great bounty. And then just to, to, to top it all off, Elijah girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab and his chariots all the way back home just to show that God can. If there was ever someone who knew of the providential hand of God, it was Elijah. To call him as a young man from nowhere, no reputation, no family ties, no graduation from the theological schools. He was just simply man of God. God used him. He had the boldness and the courage to believe in God, to go straight to the king and declare, thus saith the Lord. When God sent him with his protection to the place where he would be all alone, he lived under that mighty hand of God and by the brook Cherith and the ravens fed him. When that chapter of his life was done, God took him to the next place where a widow would provide for him. And he would see the power in the hand of God. And he would see his life being used in the master's business. And in the time when it was in God's time, I'm sure he wondered if it was not after six months or nine months or a year or 18 months or two years or three years or but three and a half years he was sent back to Ahab and they had the showdown on Mount Carmel and he believed and he trusted and he acted upon that belief not just saying that he believed but he acted upon it he put his life on the line and God came through and showed himself strong and the fire came from heaven and fell Burn up the sacrifice. A couple of weeks from now, I'm going to be preaching on Sunday morning about that type sacrifice. We'll talk about our Lord Jesus being that sacrifice. But God did everything that he said he would and he could. And everyone fell down and worshiped God and praised God because of who he is and what he had done. And now... After this set of events, and now they're back home, and Ahab goes back to his wife, and he tells his wife Jezebel exactly what had happened. Let's just read together verse 1, 1 Kings chapter number 19. God's word said, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She's speaking of the prophets of Baal. How dare you kill my prophets? And I'm sure she considered them her prophets. She was a goddess of the, of the prophetess of Baal. She probably felt ownership and into that and she had invested her life into that and she made a bold and a bullying statement meant to intimidate so let the gods do to me and more if I do not do the same thing to you by tomorrow bullies are all talk aren't they bullies try to intimidate you bullies try to keep you from being all that God wants you to be they want to impose themselves, their thoughts, their will, their force upon you. They want to say to you that you're not enough and you have to fall in line with me. I'm grateful that our God leads. He doesn't shove. 
I'm, gr I'm grateful that our God loves us and draws us to himself. But yet, if you, do not if you do not choose to follow the one true God, then that's on you. He's not going to force one person to go to heaven that does not want to go. He's not going to say to one person, you have to spend an eternity with me. You have to heed my word. Now, if we do not heed his word, there are consequences of it. If we do not choose to go to heaven, there is a consequence that goes with that. You cannot have both. But the leadership of God is a loving leadership. It's a respectful leadership. God doesn't bully. God doesn't push. And God's people should not do the same. Our Lord was meek. That's strength under control. That's the power of creation limited by the will of God. That's the God who can do all things, but choosing to only do the right thing. With Noah, he showed the world the consequences of bad choices. And we need to heed that warning. I understand that he gave us the rainbow, and I understand that he gave us promise. But we need to understand that what he was trying to tell us, that God is the God that is in control. And if we so choose not to follow after him, there are consequences that come from that. There is judgments that will most definitely come. But the words of a bully most of the time mean absolutely nothing. Think of it this way. What, what stood behind her? What was the power behind her? What was the authority behind her words to make her words come to life? 400 dead prophets. A bunch of idle chatter to an unknown, non-existent God that was quiet and could not answer. Inept, what power was behind the man of God, Elijah? All the power of El Shaddai, God Almighty, Lord of hosts, Lord of Sabbath, Lord of all, our provider, our sustainer, are all in all. The one who is holy. The one who is separate. The one who cannot be contained. Cannot be limited. Cannot be held back. He proved his point. And yet, look what Elijah did after hearing the words, the nonsensical words of a bully. Verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Left his servant there. It's almost as if he is saying, I quit, I give, I'm leaving you behind, I'm walking away. He ran. How could a man who had seen the power of God cover every step that he had taken, how could a man pray a simple prayer of faith and trust and belief knowing that the God who could would answer and send fire from heaven without a cloud in the sky to consume the altar of wet wood and the offering that's on it. How could a, God, a man who believed in such a great God fall prey to such a weak nothing as Jezebel? Listen, it happens to us all the time. All the time. All the time. We feel safe and confined in this room. Amen? 
There's great praise. Brother Mark, we love you. Musicians, we love you. Thank you for leading us into that. The prompter of our heart. How can I say thanks for the things that you have done for me? Things so undeserved that you gave your only life for me. Look, my tribute to God be the glory. We can come in this place and our hearts can be in tune with him. And the tune and fork of the spirit in our life can come alive. And we can say praise be to the Father. And then we leave out there and, and a nothing can come up and yell boo at us and we'll run. And the things that we know to be life, we will not follow. It burdens me that my burden for souls is not greater. Does it you? It burdens me that this thing of truth can sometimes still be seen as adjustable rather than letting truth be the plumb line and us quit doubting it and arguing with it, but just follow it. Deciding whether we would be obedient to God or not. We've all been there and we live there. Sometimes between Mount Sinai and the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Well, there were some natural things there. He was tired. He was weary. Be careful of being in the physical state of being weary. Depression many times happens when you're physically weak and tired and weary, malnourished, worn out. The God that I know is the, also the God of rest. And for some of us, we need to remember that the God who gave us the energy to go is also the God who gave us the idea of rest. He found himself weary from an emotional high. Be very careful about the after what happens after the great victory. What happens after when, when all is good and all is wonderful and we have the revival and, and our soul is spurred and within us and, and we have such vigor and we've, we've led someone to the Lord and, and wonderful things are happening. Be very careful. Be very careful of the emotional fall-off that will happen after that. I will, I will promise you that, that one of the, the things that happens to preachers is we'll go to conferences, and we'll hear great preaching, and we'll be challenged, and we'll hear great teaching, and we'll take great notes. I've heard some of the best. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard men like E.V. Hill and... and Adrian Rogers and Jerry Vines and Bill Stafford, Ron Dunn, W.A. Criswell. I've heard these, these power, I could go on and on. I've sat in the presence of some of God's greatest. And you have these times and, and Bradley, you come home from these conferences and you're ready to, to, to conquer the world. And then you face reality and how quickly you can fall from it. Wisdom is knowing that. Wisdom is knowing that. I was at a conference one time, and they had, had a, this was at Bellevue Baptist Church, actually, and they had a, uh, put some chairs up, and they were asking questions from the audience. And they, one of the questions was, what do you do with the struggles of the ministry, and how do you keep from having burnout, and, and what do you do when you're tired and weary? And they went around, and all these great men were giving all the great examples, and they went to... Uh, uh, John, uh, Ron, oh goodness, Phillips. What's his name? John Phillips, who wrote the exploring books. Rick, oh, Rick's not here tonight. John Phillips. And John Phillips sat up there and he said, I take a nap. And that's exactly kind of what happened. The whole place kind of hushed, and then there was a little slow laugh that went across the whole place. And he said, If I'm in the middle of the afternoon and I'm tired, I take a nap. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many preachers would have had the guts to say what he just said. Yet there was still great wisdom in it. 
there's great understanding that we can't live our life on the mountaintop all the time. Please remember this. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember the story, Mark 9, Luke 9? What did Peter say? Hey, man, let's build booths up here for y'all. He was wanting to stay up on the mountain. But what happened? God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And the next thing you know, they're going down the mountain, and when they get to the bottom of the mountain, what do they find? A fight. A fight between the disciples and the Pharisees. We want to live up on the mountain. We want to live up where the fire from heaven just falls every time that we pray and all the wonderful things happen and, and we can pray and, and, and heaven can be changed, but we can't live there. We've got to come down from the mountain too. But the growth happens in the valley. Sometimes... We've got to want it really bad before we get it. I appreciate y'all coming tonight. I appreciate that you wanting to be back for Sunday night to praise the Lord together and look into God's Word and see, as Broad has said in his prayer, how can we be challenged from his Word to go out and live a greater life? I need that too. I appreciate that. I appreciate your hunger wanting more. I don't think you're here tonight for a checklist. Hey, God, I was at church on Sunday night. Now listen to my prayer. No, I don't think you're here tonight for that. But praise God for somebody who wants more. More of Christ. More about Jesus. Would I know? Understand that while he was there and while he is weary... Look what happens in verse 4. He went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, Lord, it's enough. Take my life. I'm no longer, I am no better than my father. You know what he's saying? I failed. You know what I think Elijah wanted? I think Elijah wanted for Ahab and Jezebel to repent. And they didn't. All of the people of God have walked away. But now all those people there on Mount Carmel are praising and saying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But because Ahab and Jezebel didn't get turned around, didn't give their heart and life to, to the Lord and follow after him, now he is saying, I am of no good. Just take me home. Depression comes when we judge ourselves greater than God judges us. He lay and slept under a broom tree. Depression and sleep go hand in hand. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Isn't it funny that instead of God sending him a messenger, a message, he sent him a minister, someone to minister to him? Instead of sending an angel to go down there and tap him on the shoulder and say, Hey, get up! You lazy, good-for-nothing so-and-so, go out back after and go to work. He didn't come to condemn him. He came down to love on him. Minister to him in his place of need. Oh, what a God we serve. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. I have no jokes for what type of cake it was. Actually, I have many jokes that tell you what type of cake it was, but you wouldn't laugh at any of them, so let's just go on from there. I like it what he says in verse 6. So he ate and drank and laid down again. I'll eat. This is good. I believe I'll take another nap. So he lays down again. The angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. By the way, remember what I said happens when you get depressed, when you're weary? What you need is rest. He slept, and the Lord let him sleep. The Lord fed him, let him sleep some more. Then all of a sudden, the Lord feeds him again. Rise and eat because the journey is too great for you. You can't do this in your strength, but I will provide for you. 
Verse 8, so he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. 250 miles. Go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, and you'll find Moses where the burning bush is. That's Mount Horeb. Go to chapter 4, verse 27. <coughs> You'll find him there on the back side of the desert at Mount Horeb, Sinai. What will become an amazing place for the children of Israel. And he says he would travel under the strength of it. Forty days and forty nights, God would hold him up and sustain him. Verse 9, when he went in, then he, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in the place and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I guarantee you, those that have been seeking the Lord and following after the Lord, you've had the Lord come up and do that to you. Don't you just love it when he comes up and says, What in the world are you doing? That's my way of saying it. What in this world are you doing? What are you doing here? What's your purpose? Are you fulfilling what I gave you to do? New Holland, are, are you using the talent that I placed before you? Are you taking the things that I've laid be before you and are you using them for my kingdom's sake? How many of y'all are going to have 24 hours tomorrow? If not, Mark will sing over you, and we'll, pre we'll preach over you, and we'll s somebody will cremate you or embalm you or something. And We're all, if God, God gives us the breath, we're all going to take 24 hours tomorrow. What I've learned is, what are we going to do with it? Have you asked yourself that question at this particular place and time in your life? Is God saying, what are you doing? Why are you here? We know he's got a plan. We know it's a plan for good. I'm going to go beyond that. It's a plan of blessing. It's a plan of usefulness. Somebody needs you. In the Lord's work, you're here to be used to be a blessing on somebody's life for the glory of God. It's not about you. Even at the book Max Licato wrote, it's not about you. What a wonderful book. I've read it many times. Well, not many times. I've read it a few times. It's a reminder. We're here for a purpose. Some people, Mark says, um, y'all study the purpose-driven life here, purpose-driven church here at New Holland. We do have a purpose. We were created for a purpose. Are you living your purpose? What are you doing here? You see, what he, what he was doing with Elijah was reminding them of his purpose, his calling on his life. Are you fulfilling that here? I'm very grateful for midlife corrections, aren't you? I'm grateful that if I'm moving in the wrong direction, I want to be moved back to the right. I, I, I pray often, Lord, if I move this way, bring me back to center. If I move this way, bring me back to center. I, I love the, the, the verse in Proverbs that says, Lord, don't give me so much so that I forget you. Or, or don't give me so little so that I will steal. I, I want to be exactly in the perfect place that God has for me. I want to be content like Paul was, no matter my circumstance. In jail, I will praise you. That's what we talked about this morning. Listen to this great man of God's pity party, verse 10. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn you down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. That's not true. I mean, the bully Jezebel made an idle threat, but he's going to come to find out that God had was working in a whole lot of people's life. God had 7,000 that had not bowed down their knee to Baal. 
God said, verse 11, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. He's in this cave, dark and weary, having his little pity party. God says, get up and walk out to the edge. All right, you picturing this in your mind? He walks out there to the edge of the cave. If you've seen Israel, I've never been to Sinai. I don't know what, but, but everywhere down there looks bleak and got the scrub bushes. That's what was amazing about that mountain was there was a scrub bush that burned that was not consumed. And he went out there and he's standing out there. Look what God says. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Church, I'm going I'm I'm to say this again, and when I say it, I want you to say amen at the end of it. All right? I'm prompting you. All right? And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and a strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. All right, now, are you picturing it? Here it comes. And it's hitting that mountain. And it's hitting it. And it's tearing rocks and throwing rocks around like it's dust. And it's just violent. And there he is with his mantle over him. And all of this is going on around him. There's a word in the Hebrew, Selah. It means this. Wow. What do you think about that? Reading in the Psalms one going through it, and all of a sudden the psalmist will just stop and say, Selah. It's like, wow. What do you think about that? What an amazing point. Here Elijah is standing, and, and God passes by, and the power of God is so amazingly, magnificently manifested that it's just taking the rocks and blowing them around and, and just rattling everything. The whole mountain's going on. And then look what it says. But the Lord was not in the wind. And afterward, after the wind, an earthquake. Anybody been through an earthquake? We had one up in, North, in Habersham County. Woke me up in the middle of the night. I thought my wife was snoring. No, 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 no. <laughs> just, that was just a joke, just a joke, just a joke. We woke up in the middle of the night, and the, and the, uh, the, the bookshelves were rattling. I didn't know it till the next day. They said we had had a, an earthquake. I didn't even know there was a fault line up there. Y'all remember, was it a 87 that the World Series was in San Francisco between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's? And it just tore that place up. All those big roads were falling apart and everything. So the earthquake. Now you're on a mountain. You think you're standing on the rock. And all of a sudden, that thing begins to shake. You know, sometimes we think the things that are going to be earth-shattering and shaking are the most magnificent things. What shook Elijah was the words of a nobody Jezebel. But now we're in the very presence of the Almighty God, and he's shaking it. And he, the whole mountain is moving. But it says there in verse 11, the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, after the earthquake of fire. I'm picking on California tonight. They've been burning up over there too, haven't they? Just blowing around. Everything's getting torched. A fire. He's seen the wind crush the rocks. The whole mountain is shook. And now the fire, the consuming fire, is all there. But once again, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, what does God's word say? Say it again. One more time. I've never seen the wind tear the rocks apart like that. 
I've never felt the earth that could shake a whole mountain. I've never seen a consuming fire like that. But I have heard a still small voice that knocked this man to his knees. The God who can do all whispers softly. But plainly and clearly, and he doesn't stutter, and he speaks directly. And he speaks in truth. And he speaks in love. And he speaks in benefit. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. Verse 13, so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. He goes on to tell Elijah, there's three things that he wants him to do, three people that he wants to call. There's a work of God. The next phase of the work of God is going to be carried out. And in all of God's grace, he's going to allow Elijah to be part of it. What we need to hear is available, and that's the still, small voice of God. There is nothing wrong with getting on your knees, beside your bed, sitting in your chair, wherever you are, and saying, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord, I need to hear your voice. Speak. Your servant wants to hear. Father, the answer is yes. You're Almighty God. Here I am and I serve you. Thank you, O Lord, for knowing me. Thank you, O Lord, for loving me. Thank you, O Lord, for saving me. Thank you, O Lord, for protecting me. Speak, for your servant is listening. See, I believe God didn't call us to religion. I believe God called us to a relationship. I believe God's not to, there to strike us down. I think he's there to lift us up. I think he's not there to scold us. I think he's there to put his arms of love around us. He knows when we are weak. He's there to minister to us. He knows when there's a work to be done. And maybe he is saying to you in that still, small voice, so what are you doing? I think sometimes the Lord wants to take an x-ray picture of our heart just so he can put it up on the light and show it to us. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. But even then, after Isaiah thought he was at his point of desperation his hero Uzziah had died God had a mission for him he had a mission for Elijah please hear this he has a mission for us would you just bow your heads right now right now in the quietness of this room would you if you feel so led say Lord speak for your servant is listening. Give me ears to hear, Lord. Speak.
Heads bowed, eyes closed. The Lord spoke. Just lift up your eyes and look at me and then you can bow your head back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you are the shepherd. We are the sheep. Sheep of your pasture. We know your voice. Thank you for calling us unto yourself. Father, the journey is too difficult. We must go in your strength. Father, thank you for not condemning us when we are down and weak and weary, worn out, depressed, tired. Father, thank you for being our rest. We can come into you, weak and weary. We can take your yoke, join in with you, walk in your strength. Lord, may we ask, or may we answer the question as you ask, I should say, why are we here? Father, I pray that we have heard from you, and we will... Leave this place seeking to fulfill the mission that you've placed before us. Thank you for the prayers, the prayer requests. Thank you for the praise. Pray, Lord, that they were acceptable unto you. Now, Father, bless us with you through your word. Remind us, Holy Spirit. Remind us the comfort of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.